be coaches of the common. This is the first episode. We're really excited. My name is Jan Mayer. I am not the star for today's episode, obviously. If you guys are wondering, this is an ongoing series of um, actually bringing in the specialists and coaches of the common, um, wherein they talk about certain topics and for you to actually ask your questions. And they are part of the common community today during lunch, I hope you're having lunch, I'm hungry, hope you had lunch. We have business strategist, of course, founder of The Common, and Ventel, Deborah Chantry here, who's the star of the show. Hey, Deborah. Hey, how are you doing, Jen? Good, good, good. So um, this is just going to be probably around 15 minutes, I yeah, would say, yeah, keep it see short, how yeah. see how we go. Now, today we are going to talk about market validation. Okay, entrepreneurs, listen up, and if you've got any questions, um, do you start typing into the comments area, and we will definitely ask those questions as we go. All right, definition of terms, kind of. Let's keep it simple, Deborah. So, what is market validation? Well, pretty simply, it's, you know, we all come up with these great ideas, right? In business, whether you're an entrepreneur, a startup, or an established business, we often go, wouldn't it be great if we could do this as a product or a service? And market validation is about taking that idea and actually seeing if it has legs. So if you go and ask your friends and your family, they'll say, yeah, great idea, Jam. Yes, you should definitely do that. And they want to be supportive. They're doing it because they want to be supportive. But the reality might be, it might be a great idea, but are actually, are there people out there who really want it? And more importantly, are they prepared to pay for it? Ah, that's very important, yeah. of course. And the last part to it is if they're prepared to pay for it, can you make it at a cost that they are prepared to pay for so you can make money from it. So it's three parts of the equation. So often we have this great idea, we go, right, let's go out there, let's launch it. We spend a whole lot of time, money, effort. Sometimes people mortgage their houses to pay to develop things, to actually go out there and develop something, only to find they launch it into the marketplace and, oh my God, nobody wants to buy it. So market validation is a little bit of a process that you can work through to say, is there a market for it? Will they pay for it? Can I make money? Gotcha. So is there actually a processes or some best practices? I mean, do I just go out and talk to people and survey? I mean, apart from the family and friends that support us, right? Um, is there, you know, is it, is there a number? Should we go for a hundred? Is it 10 enough? Yep. No. So generally we like to, so if you do it properly and formally, we'd say around a hundred people will give you enough information to make a decision. Yep. And that's why in three different phases. It's not a hundred people all up. We do phase one, we usually do about 10 people just to get a sense of it. Phase two, we'll do um, between 20 and 50 and then 50 in the final phase as well. But the first part is actually to look at, you know, who is your target audience first of all? Because it's not family and friends. So you have to be really, really clear. Who is the target audience, what do they look like, what are the key things that I'm looking for in them before I go and to actually ask them questions. And we usually have one question which we call, um, I suppose, a, what's, the, what's the right term for it, where you decide whether or not the right person to ask the question. So either knock them out and say, no, I shouldn't be talking to them, or we'll actually include them and yes, they're part of that market validation. So we'll usually have a question that will say something along the lines of, um, give me an example of a new product you might be thinking to launch. Um, oh gosh, well, let's pretend a, a new cafe in, around Parnell. Okay, a new cafe around Parnell. So the first thing you might want to actually think about is, um, does a person actually spend time visiting cafes? Because if they don't, then the reality is you can knock them out straight away, you don't want to interview them. So the first question might be, do you regularly visit cafes? If they say yes, then you want to include them in the market validation. So that's our first um, defining question, if you like. So you're basically qualifying or pre-qualifying before qualifying and asking your questions, if that makes any sense. Yeah, that you've got the right yeah. people you're sitting in front of. Right. Otherwise, and we had a classic one. We did one um, at the Ice House. We had a company that was looking to actually take um, cows and grow them, <laughs> um, fat them up, and then basically sell, follow their process through and then actually sell them by chopping them up and, and delivering them to your door, which sounds wonderful. One of the questions that we really need to know, though, was do you have a deep freeze? Because if you don't have a deep freeze, you're actually not in the target audience to receive half a cow chopped up ready to go to the freezer. So we could ask you all the questions, you could say that's a fantastic idea, yes, 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 I love it, I love it, I love it, yes I'm prepared to pay for it, and then we go, where are you going to put the cow, Jam? And they go, oh, good point. So the first question that we actually asked before asking anything else was A, do you eat meat, because that was the biggest one, and B, do you have a freezer? Now if they answer no to either of those two questions, they're not the right place people you're talking to. Right, interesting. And again, just going to pause a bit for those who are watching right now, either on Facebook or on Instagram. So we've got two cameras here. 
please start asking your questions. This is your chance to ask an expert in the field about market validation. Um, do we have any questions from the audience who's here? Um, yep. Um, is it really necessary to um, ask 100 people to validate your idea? Yeah, um, we say 100 is a good number, it doesn't have to be 100. So what we find often if you do the first 10, you might see trends actually forming. If you see trends actually forming and you go through the second phase and you've got the same trends happening again, this is not about quantitative data. So it's not saying this is an absolute, it's about getting a sense of where the market sits at. So sometimes you can do 20 or 30 and it's actually enough to know you're on the right track. But if you do the first 10 and the answers are all over the place, then you really have to drill down and get more into the specifics and start asking more people. And then we might suggest you go to 100 just to make sure you can actually validate that that is the right answer that you're actually getting. Okay, thank you. Yep, here's another one from the audience. How do you find these people to interview? Yep, very good question. Because again, we don't really want family and friends. So the best thing you can do, we're doing it sort of right here right now in some respects, is using social media. So you go out there and say, I am looking for people who meet this kind of criteria to ask some questions, to validate my idea. And the important thing is it's not a selling tool. So you're not going out there to talk to them to sell them your idea. In fact, absolutely the opposite. The last thing you want to do is actually lead them down a path to give you the answer you want. So you're actually looking for people to actually validate the ideas. You're not selling anything. I just want to talk to you about your opinions. I want to get a sense of where things are at and you go out to the marketplace and go right I'm looking for people who can help with this and you go that's the best place to start. You can also tap into networks so for example the meet example I gave we actually went there's actually a meet lovers association in Auckland so that is a perfect place to go to to actually go and find some meet lovers you can actually talk to. So if you're opening a cafe there, there might be a Facebook group that is all around cafe lovers so you look for different groups you can actually tap into to talk to. And how normally how long does the process take? I mean, does it have to be weeks, months, or it depends? Um, it very much depends on how much time you've got to give to it, because I mean that's the, the key part. These are, we're talking about face-to-face -face interviews here, so there is a real tendency, yes, for people to go, oh, can't I do a survey monkey or a Google survey? And the reality is, I mean, how many of you go online and do a survey, and you know you get to question number five and you're getting a bit tired of it, and so you just kind of just tick whatever, you don't get the real answers. When I'm sitting face-to-face -face with you and I ask you a question, and we always start with open-ended questions. So Jam, in the experience of buying um, steak, you know, what's the biggest issue you have that's an open-ended question right and from that we get a sense of what the biggest challenge or opportunity is I'm sitting here face to face with you I can see if there is something going on in your mind that I want to delve further so you might say oh it's the price of it and I go oh that's really interesting tell me more and I'll actually gauge what's going on with you and then I can adjust my questions accordingly so if you're not doing that face to face you're trying to do it through a survey monkey or Google you're not actually picking yeah. up on those cues and it's not about following an absolute set so I'm not sitting here going right question number one Jam I'd like to ask you this question number two <laughs> right this is it so it's actually about um, having a conversation because what we're trying to do is validate the whole idea and where you're at so what we want to do is want to um, listen to your answers and then delve a bit deeper and say, right, what does that really mean? So I might ask an open-ended question, tell me the biggest challenge that you have um, in trying to find a decent cafe in Parnell. And you'll say to me, oh, parking is the biggest issue, because we had that issue here a little while ago. And I go, okay, that's interesting. Tell me why that's an issue for you. Oh, well, when I go to the cafe, I'm usually meeting somebody. I'm only going to be there for a few minutes. I don't want to have to waste time and be late by trying to find a car park. So that kind of information I'll get from talking to you. I won't get that from a survey. And that that's can, well, obviously. I mean, how does that work now um, for, say, companies or entrepreneurs who has an idea that would probably be a global product? I mean, do you go on Skype and just randomly yeah. pick, or from the groups? Probably not randomly. I don't know. Uh, yeah, Actually, it's a good question. Should we just randomly exactly, or just filter through, as you said earlier? Ask the question and those who say yes, then you go on to the next. Ask device. the question and be really clear about demographics too. So there's no point if you're launching a product for teenage boys, and I always say that and then I go, oh my god, that sounds really odd. But if you're launching <laughs> a product for teenage <laughs> boys, you don't want to be talking to 50 year old women like myself because I'm not going to give you the, the right answer. So you yeah. go, what are the demographics? Who am I going after? And then you have that qualifying question yeah. and you ask that question to kind of get them in or out. Um, yes, if you're going globally, it's absolutely no different. I still recommend you do it face to face, but face to face could be by Zoom or by Skype. But right. still trying to look at those cues in that person's face so that's the whole point of doing it face to face is I can actually look at you I can see if you pause 
Um, the phone, you can do it by phone. We have done them by phone before, and it's not, it's not um, essential you're face to face. I just feel like you get a better sense of a person if you're actually looking at them and looking for those visual clues. So globally, you might go out to a group again and say, hey, I'm looking for these people. Um, obviously, time zones come into play, but you yeah. just make sure that, and it usually takes a good market validation survey will take between 20 minutes and 60 minutes, depending on how complex the problem is you're actually solving. So you say to them, hey, look, I'm going to need 20 to 60 minutes. If they're globally, obviously you can't offer them much in return for that, but you could offer them a voucher or something to actually, you know, to, to encourage them to help you. Yeah. If it's local, you can say, look, look, let's go to the cafe, I'll shout you a muffin, um, or yeah. I'll come to your work, I'll bring you a cup of coffee, whatever it might be, yeah. because these people are giving you their time. But what yeah. I have learned, people go, oh, but people won't give me six minutes of their time because they're so busy. People like to help. If I right. say to you, Jan, can you help me? Yeah. But chances are most people will say, yeah, I'd love to help you. But if you try and start selling me something, that's it, you know, turn me off completely and you'll never get the answers out of me. Gotcha. Yeah. So other than surveys, face-to-face, -face, Zoom, Skype, etc., is there any other way of validating the market or is it that's the only way to do it? I believe that's the best way to do it. I won't say the only way, that's the best way to do it. If you really, right. really want to test it. Because the other thing is we're testing not only the idea, we're testing will they pay for it. And again, if you put a survey out there and you ask, first of all, an open-ended question, what will you pay for it? Yeah. Sure, they'll they'll give you an answer. If you then say to them, you know, what will you, if it, if it costs $50, would you pay for it? I can immediately tell in your face, if you say yes, are you being completely truthful or is there some kind of hesitation there? Whereas again, on a survey, which you do online, you can't tell what that person is thinking. So they might give you false results in terms of just you know, picking the answer that they think you want to hear or the answer that um, they haven't really thought about. Yeah, and it, it just reminded me about pricing and probably that is another session in one of our episodes about you know the right pricing and do people tend to answer, say, hey, pick a price, and of course the lowest one is the one that they pick? Um, um, I don't know if you've got any thoughts about that, just yeah. sort of a preview in terms of market validation. I mean, how Interestingly, no, they don't, but what is interesting is if you ask them the open-ended question, they sometimes have no idea. So then you prompt right. them and you give them some examples of what they might pay, and then you've got to be really realistic. People will sit here and they'll say to you, yeah, 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 I would pay $50 for that. Um, you've got to get them to put the money where their mouth is. So when you actually finish the validation questions, you actually say to them, so, okay, if I develop this product further and I get it ready to go, would you be interested in me contacting you to tell me about it? Because then you're building a database of potentially up to 100 people who can actually then be recontacted and yeah. you can actually really put the hard wood on them and go, right, okay, I've now got a product. Are you prepared to pay $50 for it? <laughs> right, okay, I'm just going to pause. Do we have any questions? Um, there are people joining. Um, oh, hey, Om, hello. Uh, hi, Om. Uh, hi, Om. <laughs> uh, yep, Talia's there. I'm just trying to look. Um, I can't scroll from here, but I'm waving to everyone. Um, are there any questions from I have the a virtual question. audience? Oh, yeah, okay. So when, uh, when you survey people and they tell you, oh, this is too expensive, what do you think they're actually telling you? that they haven't seen the value in it yet. Mm. So as a coach, don't forget, this is what I do day in, day out, I actually believe that price is never really the issue at all. Um, so it usually means they haven't seen the value in terms of you know what you're actually offering. So once you actually offer the value, pricing becomes almost irrelevant. Now that's not to say, there is definitely a price limit for things, but I always give this classic example. I'm a real handbag and shoes girl, right? I love handbags and shoes. I am particularly fond of Louis Vuitton handbags because I think they're beautifully made. Now I've never been able to afford a brand new one just yet, but I've got several of them in my collection. And what I always say, you think about a handbag, I can buy a black leather handbag from the warehouse for probably around 20 or $30. dollars I can buy a black leather handbag from something like Oroton or that sort of mid-range for a couple of hundred dollars. If I buy a Louis Vuitton handbag brand new, it's around about $4,000. Now that's a huge jump between $20 and $4,000. However, what I see in the Louis Vuitton brand, you know, it's a great plug for Louis Vuitton right now, but it's all beautifully handmade. It comes with a sort of a warranty or guarantee. Um, I know that there's a lot of thought gone into the design of it, and I know that it will make me feel really special. So I have seen the value of $4,000 when in reality, I bet the cost of goods for that is no more than the Oroton or maybe a bit more than the, the $20 warehouse one, but it's not its not that big a difference. So I always believe pricing is around value. Awesome, awesome. Okay, well, we've got a few minutes, actually probably one or two minutes. Um, I just want to spend this time to invite you, um, either you're watching live right now or if you're um, watching this um, after, which is the recording, we are going to have this series every week. Oh, 
podcast every week. Free coaching, business coaching tips from all the experts and specialists. I mean, seriously, this is part of the common. Yep. Um, and we will do this every Tuesday, 12.30. Every Tuesday. And we've got um, some amazing coaches on board. So I mean, next we've got Mandy coming up, which we'll talk about in a minute. We've got coaches that specialize in, in taking products overseas. We've got coaches that specialize in um, IT and software. We've got coaches that specialize in service provision. We've got a financial and property expert coming on a couple of weeks' time. So we've got a whole range of coaches. The idea being that we want to offer you the full support that you need and you know we want to share with you what we know that we can help you in achieving your goals exactly that's why i'm here yep i get it. cool so next week we are going to have mandy yep. mandy reeve who specializes in quarter life crisis coaching is there such a thing deborah that's hmm. the question we'll be actually asking so is there such a thing as quarter life crisis and mandy is the expert in this area she'll tell us exactly what that looks like and what it means and the answer is yes but of course we'll find out what that actually means and how you can deal with it What's quarter life, by the way? Let's not talk about age. Yeah, there's a Ooh. question from the internet as well. Oh, there is yeah. a question? Yes. What, what's the question? Sorry? Uh, where is mid, mid quarter life crisis? So what is it? Um, is that so basically? quarter life crisis? If you think about, it, you've got the midlife crisis. Generally, happens somewhere between sort of 40 and 55 is when you have that midlife. That's when men go off and um, have affairs <laughs> and my motorbikes, and women like myself go off and buy motorbikes. But anyway, but then you've also so the quarter life is, is a little bit younger than that. So it's generally somewhere between 25 and sort of 35 when you're ah. starting to question, is this it? Is this all there is? But uh, I'm not the expert by any means. Mandy can tell us all about that next week. Awesome. That I'm excited about that. Um, I will pretend I'm part of that age group. I could, right? <laughs> yeah, definitely. Again, next week, hey, we'd want you to visit the Common if you're around the area. We're here at 1 Faraday Street. It's a 1 Faraday building here at Parnell. Parking isn't really a problem anymore. That's yeah, I'm sure you've seen our posts. So come on over if you want to be part of the audience here live at Parnell at the Common. Please put in your name um, on the comments um, in the comments area, and then you can definitely we'll, we'll get in touch with you guys so that we can give you more information and ask your questions about next week's topic. Thank you so much for your time, Deborah. This is an awesome place, by the way, and awesome that, uh, things that you offered. And there's puppies. Oh, oh yes, and there's puppies. Yay! <laughs> we love them. We do. Thanks, everyone. Thank See you, you next week. See you. Good ladies, I'm proud of you. <laughs> Yay! Are we, are we, I mean, we're not. I'm still trying to cut off the feed. So oh, so we're, we're, still, still we're still live. Okay, yeah. so we're okay. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Look at the puppies, look at the puppies! <laughs> <laughs> puppies, puppies! Cool. I think I might need a hand with that, Jam. Okay, I will okay. now go to production. <laughs> Thanks, Jam. Thank <laughs> you.